This video is brought to you by Nebula, the streaming platform created by and for creators. The video you're about to watch is the second in a seven episode series about the history of the electric guitar solo. If it's got your interest and you want to watch the next, you can head on over to Nebula with the link in the description. There you'll be able to watch episode three with no ads and extended music clips. The entire series is going to continue coming to Nebula first, so check it out if you want to support the work and be the first to see it. And if you're already a Nebula follower, Thank you so much for helping to make this channel a reality. In 1956, Chuck Berry walked out to a full house of 6,000 eager fans at New York's Paramount Theater. He and his band were wearing new suits they'd bought specifically for the show, but by the time they got on stage, these suits were wrinkled beyond recognition. Barry didn't want to look the fool, so to distract the crowd, he decided to pull out an old gag from his childhood. He crouched down, hobbled across the stage, and started to bob his head while playing his guitar. The fans went nuts. Barry remembered the moment in a 1969 interview with Rolling Stone. I got an ovation, so I figured I pleased the audience, so I did it again, and again, and I'll probably do it again tonight. This strange dance move was called the Duck Walk. It became Barry's signature move, and remained a staple of his performances for the rest of his career. This sort of electric guitar-centered showmanship was something that much of the music world had never seen before. Combined with Barry's energetic playing, it was the final step in bringing the electric guitar out from the sidelines and into center stage, where it always belonged. By the end of the 1940s, the electric guitar was here to stay. Advances in pickup and amplifier technology gave the instrument the volume and bite that it needed to thrive in front of raucous crowds. Meanwhile, creative innovations by musicians like Junior Bernard, Charlie Christian, and T-Bone Walker had proved the guitar's viability as a lead instrument. Walker was one of the finest in a generation of blues players who started on acoustic and picked up electric midway through their career. He translated the tradition of blues showmanship to his new instrument, and was even known to solo with his teeth from time to time. The pinnacle of Walker's career was 1948's greasy Call It Stormy Monday. Stormy Monday influenced countless future guitarists, but none more so than a young Mississippi man by the name of B.B. King. In his autobiography, Blues All Around Me, B.B. King remembered hearing Stormy Monday for the first time. Jesus himself had returned to Earth playing electric guitar. T-Bone's blues filled my insides with joy and good feeling. Walker inspired King to take up the electric guitar, and it wouldn't be long before King was recording his own blues hits. The first of those hits was 1951's Three O'Clock Blues, which topped Billboard's Rhythm and Blues chart. <laughs> King's style built on walkers, stretching the solos out and teasing every last bit of emotion from the guitar. Throughout the 1950s, B.B. King became one of the most prolific bluesmen ever to play and earned the auspicious title, King of the Blues. And B.B. King was one of the first guitarists ever to have a famous guitar, Black Gibson that he named Lucille. Lucille got its name in 1949, when King was playing a dance hall that erupted into a brawl, and then a fire. The hall was evacuated, but King ran back inside to save his instrument. The next morning, he learned that the brawl began with two men fighting over a woman named Lucille. So King decided to name his guitar in honor of Lucille, as a reminder to never do something so stupid as run into a burning building again. Lucille has actually been a number of guitars over the years, and in 1980, Gibson even launched their own model, called the BB King Lucille. 
The music that King played on Lucille was not technically complex. He was the first to admit that many of his contemporaries were better technical guitarists than him. But King was able to take simple patterns and load them with feeling. He was particularly adept at bending his notes to create a wavering tonality that imitated the human voice and allowed his blues to have a deep catharsis. While King's career was taking off, a number of other guitarists were also taking less technical approaches to the instrument. In dance halls and high schools across the country, rhythm and blues was beginning to morph into a new movement that would soon be called rock and roll. One of the earliest rock and roll guitar solos was heard on Big Mama Thornton's Hound Dog, played by another T-Bone Walker disciple in Pete Guitar Lewis. A few years later, Elvis Presley would record his own version of Hound Dog, which featured a wild solo by Scotty Moore. <laughs> Hound Dog was a monumental success that brought the brilliant innovations of a generation of black rhythm and blues players to white audiences. But the legacy of Elvis and rock and roll is complicated, as many of the genre's black trailblazers got neither the credit nor the royalties they deserved. Nevertheless, in the hands of Elvis, rock music became a sensation and Moore became one of the first true rock guitarists. He was soon joined by Danny Cedroni, who played guitar for Bill Haley and his Comets. In 1954, they scored one of the biggest hits of the early rock era, Rock Around the Clock, featuring a classic guitar solo. As the first wave of rock and roll was exploding in the mid-50s, it was already fusing with country music to create an early subgenre, rockabilly. In 1955, Carl Perkins had a huge rockabilly hit with Blue Suede Shoes, featuring a solo played by Perkins himself. <laughs> The rockabilly songs of this era were often structured around simple verse-chorus-verse patterns interjected with short guitar solos. One of the most beloved guitarists of the era was Buddy Holly, who earned the Crickets a gold record with his brilliant playing on 1967's That'll Be The Day. While rockabilly was keeping things brief, a number of guitarists were experimenting with longer instrumental solo pieces. One of the most explosive examples of this is Johnny Guitar Watson's 1954 experimental piece, Space Guitar. <laughs> Watson played his guitar fingerstyle, but loaded the song with wild, rapid-fire bursts of energy. He soaked it in reverb and made it as loud as he possibly could. The result is a song that would have felt at home in the psychedelic soundscapes of 1967. <laughs> It was so ahead of its time that reviewers didn't really know what to do with it. A Billboard review for the song gave it two question marks rather than a numerical score and declared, this could break a few eardrums if it's played too loud. That sort of reaction to guitar music was becoming more and more commonplace by the end of the decade. Link Ray's 1958 instrumental Rumble was banned from several radio stations because people worried it would start gang fights. <laughs> 
Ray and other guitarists like him were testing the bounds of distortion by sabotaging their own amps to create a thicker fuzz sound. Grumble is heavy and sludgy and contains some of the earliest portents of metal music. With all due respect to Link Ray, there's one guitar solo from 1958 that reigns above them all, Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good. <laughs> Berry lifted the iconic lick of Johnny B. Good from a 1946 R&B hit by Louis Jordan called Ain't That Just Like a Woman. Barry wasn't shy about acknowledging these influences. Speaking with Johnny Carson in 1987, he said, The main guy was Louis Jordan. I wanted to sing like Nat King Cole, with lyrics like Louis Jordan, with the swing of Benny Goodman with Charlie Christian on guitar, playing Carl Hogan's riffs with the soul of Muddy Waters. By combining his many disparate influences, Barry ended up becoming instrumental in the creation of something new. Rock and roll music had been gestating through the 50s, but in most of the biggest acts, the guitarist played second fiddle to a charismatic frontman. When Barry hit the scene, that would change forever. Chuck Berry was a singer, guitarist, dancer, and showman, all wrapped up in one. And he wasn't humble about it. Johnny B. Good is an ode to Barry's own success, a celebration of his own guitar talent. And a minute and a half into the song, Barry backs up his lyrical bravado. He tears into a fiery solo that serves as a perfect distillation of everything guitarists had been building to ever since the first pickup was plugged in. With Chuck Berry, the electric guitar had achieved its destiny. It was more than just an instrument. It was the lifeblood of the most exciting music to hit America in generations. As John Lennon said, if you tried to give rock and roll another name, you might call it Chuck Berry. And as Chuck Berry was making the guitar the main character of rock, a generation of young musicians were listening at home with ears glued to the radio. Before long, these guitarists would find themselves at the forefront of a political and cultural movement the likes of which the world had never seen. If you want to watch the next episode of this series, it's already up on Nebula with no ads and extended solo clips. And that's not all. Nebula has an incredible slate of exclusive originals by creators like Lindsay Ellis, Maggie Mae Fish, Volksgeist, and of course, yours truly. Signing up with the link in the description will also get you access to Nebula classes, where you can learn things like video editing, music production, or you can watch my class about musical and lyrical analysis. So check it out with the link in the description and get an annual plan for 40% off. For the price of a cup of coffee a month, that gets you incredible access to a growing wealth of content, and it also just does a whole lot to help support me and help me keep making videos like this. Thank you so much for watching.